Welcome to this episode of UMBC's Mic'd Up Podcast. My name is Denise Cardona from the Office of Professional Programs at UMBC. Today, we are joined by Jonathan Jett Palmer. He is a recent graduate of our Graduate Certificate in College Teaching and Learning Science, as well as Master of Science in Systems Engineering. I hope you enjoy this episode. Thanks so much for joining us today on the UMBC Mic'd Up podcast, Jonathan. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. So you just graduated with your certificate in the College Teaching and Learning Science program. How are you feeling since graduating? Well, I'm certainly glad to have a little more free time back, but that camaraderie that I experienced in the program was something that really moved me along and gave me I think probably an incentive to go deeper than I would have expected. So it's that sort of a bit of feeling of loss, but at the same time, what now can I do? How far can I go with what I've taken on at UMBC? I totally agree with that feeling. I graduated as well in May with a my master's in the Learning and Performance Technology program. And I feel I felt a little lost after that because there is so much that goes into graduate work and working with your peers, working with the faculty, working with your projects. It's fun. It's really rewarding, but it does take up a lot of time. Let's not kid ourselves. And so after all of that is done, you're like, I remember sitting back and going, whoa, this is a new feeling for me because my program took me three years. And I was like, wow, I actually have time to like cook without rushing and make some puzzles, get away from technology a little bit. So it's nice, but it's that bittersweet feeling of, yeah, something's, well, something's done now, and now it's time for something new. Yes. So tell me, what is is new now since you've graduated? What are you doing now? So uh, I'm still still finishing up active orders. I'm active military, so I'm working down in in Washington, D.C., and I will carry on that through the end of uh, 24. But I'm also engaging and preparing for that next career step. So we, we have multiple careers now. It's not one and done like uh, maybe our parents had. Um, so I'm looking forward to finding a place, hopefully somewhere in, in an academic or professional academic setting where I can leverage uh, my experience and the skill set that I found really to be invaluable from the program offered at UMBC. Wow. So what service are you in with the military? So I'm in the Navy. And interestingly, the Navy, like many other large organizations, have really embraced this lifelong learning concept. The pace of technological change, the pace of uh, dealing with personnel, the pace of just the world has so accelerated that we really can't afford to stand still in any capacity. Uh, I was starting to see that in my civilian job before I took a recall. uh, And that's what prompted me to go back and and refresh uh, my skill set. I also found that I was doing much more mentoring and teaching, and I really felt a little ill-equipped. What was the best methodology? There's lots of discussions, and I've certainly been through plenty of not good coursework. So I thought, how how can I be a better mentor, teacher, instructor, uh, guide, if you will, for folks who are working with me or for me? Mm, That's a really good point. First of all, thank you for your service. Uh, my parent, my father, and my brother are both Navy. My husband is a uh, Marine. Uh, yeah, I'm all, yeah, I, just, I love the military and all that you all do. So thank you so much for that service. And I'm sure that it's a balancing act being still active military and being in graduate school. That's got to be a, a little bit of a balancing act and a little bit of a challenge, I'm assuming. How, how is that? It is. I, I think my experience of military service has been there's a significant value for the educational process. And it doesn't matter what rank you are. Folks who come in, and you may know this uh, from talking to your family members, the the outside world sees, oh, join the military and get money for school. But what's not really well understood is while you're in the military, there's an expectation of continuing education development. Sometimes it's in a technical space, sometimes it's in a professional space. There are a number of actually military postgraduate schools and I find that we have a pretty well-established culture of learning. And in fact, you generally don't advance as well if you haven't exhibited a desire to continue to self-improve. It could be as simple as a reading list to very formal courses. I also pursued a graduate degree 
at the same time as my CTLS certificate in systems engineering that has benefited me in my role here uh, at the Navy Yard. And actually, so has the certificate. So it's, it is a, uh, it's demanding, but there's a bit of an understanding that we're, we're going to give you a little leeway to do what you need to do. Don't overdo it. Uh, but the expectation is clear that you need to continue to work on yourself and, and make yourself a uh, better service member and deal with the constant changes that we're facing globally. Great philosophy, lifelong learning, and it's really nice to hear that the military is embracing that as well because we are pretty much, when you think about it, the sum of our country, of the quality of the education that's coming out of it is a direct result of those the, the input that we're putting into it. And so it's wonderful to hear when organizations, institutions embrace that lifelong learning. It's vital that as members of our society that we continue to raise the bar for ourselves and for others to go beyond what is comfortable sometimes and seek those things that are going to help really make life better for everybody that we touch. So that's fantastic to hear. And one thing that I picked up on that you said earlier is one of the reasons, it sounds like one of the motivations for you starting in the CTLS graduate program is that you wanted to be able to improve the learning journey for other people based on some of maybe the experiences that you had in a classroom. Can you talk a little bit about that motivational factor? And I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, so I'm an engineer originally by training, that's my undergraduate. And then I, I took on a, uh, an MBA later and then the systems engineering uh, graduate degree, master's, and I can recall as an undergraduate, a very one-way process, especially in engineering, you were stuck with what you were stuck with, students had very little agency, uh, and I could see, in my own experience, was there were periods where I struggled and felt like there really wasn't any avenue either to engage with the instructor or the curriculum, or provide any sort of feedback. Uh, we didn't have college surveys at the time that we do now around instructors. And I recognize that's not just unique to higher education, it's professional education. And I have found myself being put in, hey, we want you to run this training, we want you to run this program, we'd like you to do this, we'd like, we have a very new emerging bit of information, and whether that was my private job or my uh, military role, you need to communicate this because you're the person. You, you're wearing the rank or you're in the position, you have to communicate. And I really felt, I'm not going to do any of these folks justice. I want them to, to take the information on board. I want them to be able to not just understand it, but apply it and also help us hone what we're providing. Because in areas, especially in science, technology, in organizational design, that information is changing so rapidly that we can't possibly know it all. So I wanted to be, I wanted to be an open instructor. I wanted to be one who was going to really engage with people are responsible for training or teaching. And I also wanted to, to be able to take on feedback from them in a manner that was additive and constructive versus just, oh, I didn't really, okay, so I'm done with that class. I don't have to worry about that. No, it, it's a continuum of your professional life. So that's where my motivation came from. Yeah, I don't want to be that instructor. That right, instructor. well, you just get stuck in the routine of it. it, it what worked before is always going to work. I know to set myself, I've delved into now instruction, facilitating, developing courses. And I was just teaching last week. And one of the things that just struck me as I was standing in front of the classroom is this constantly changes from year to year. I've been teaching with this organization for three years. Every year is a different, every group of students creates a different environment. And it's pulling from that information we learn in our graduate studies, and working with our peers and our instructors and reading and just educating ourselves on what are some of the scientifically based ways that we can apply the art and science to delivering instruction that's going to be the most impactful for our students. So it's a really cool place to be when you open up your mind and you say, yes, this isn't the way, I can't keep doing things the way I always do them. I have to constantly be looking for this, for the new, for the next level, for the next way to help bring this classroom to mastery, if you will. How did the program prepare you for what you're doing now? Any specific examples or just ways that 
people who are listening in or viewing this on YouTube, who maybe this is their first time learning about the College Teaching and Learning Science Certificate Program here at UMBC, that maybe you can give, give some kind of um, idea of what worked for you in the program. I, I'll, I think I'll hit on the last word of the, the Nayland strip at the science. Throughout the, and the, the, the five course regimen that is really uh, laid out for this certificate, to me, in each and every course, there was foundational, and as an engineer, I really appreciated this, foundational, demonstrated, proven, scientific approaches to assessment design, student engagement, how even curriculums are built or you're going to develop, especially there's quite a bit of discussion around online instruction. And there were good sound methodologies. I'm thinking back to my Quality Matters uh, class that we took, and I was astounded at the level of detail and analysis that had been conducted. And as a recipient, as a student, you think, oh, they're the PhD, and they just... And the reality is the best instructors, the best teachers, the best professors have embraced this scientific approach when they were going back and evaluating their assessments and saying, yeah, this question is not working. And I'm obviously missing some connection here for my staff or my students. And then what engagement techniques are we going to use based on the material and the outcomes desired for the course? And that to me was unexpected. And it's something that I really embraced because now I can have some conversations as we develop materials. Hey, is, is this delivering the objective we want? Or are we just, as you said, doing what we always did? I found that to be extremely unexpected but also very exciting because I was able to, to go through the quality matter, matters process and I go back to that because there were certified assessors who go back and look at courses and it's no small task and no small amount of work to meet those high standards. And that was uh, very impressive. And when I saw courses that had met those standards and saw them in action, it was clear that they were having a much better effect uh, on the students and much better effect on the outcomes of learning. So you saw those in real life action, yeah. which is, yeah, that's the coolest thing is that you see it applied. So anything applied in real life is something that sticks, I think, emotionally to us as well. And it makes us have that moment, that light bulb moment that says, ha, huh, OK, this is how it's supposed to work. And having that structure, poof, that's so key, isn't it? So now there's never any guesswork when it comes to there's a system in place. And whenever you have a system, you can at least go back to those foundations to be able to build upon those foundations and maybe experiment a little bit as you move forward, that comfort zone beyond the comfort zone we talked about. Being able to take what the basics are, building upon that structure, using it as a framework and being able to experiment and grow your courses from there and the experiences that you're going to give your students. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's so critical because those students have come in at whatever level and there's an enormous amount of uh, trust that's being placed in the instructor. And if you can come to them and say, look, we're going to start from a basis of a known foundation or an established uh, practicum or an established design, and then the variations will work through together. It may be your own experience, it may be your background, it may be how you're digesting this material. But at least we don't have to worry about the structure. We can then begin to deal with those differences, and they don't become overwhelming. And that, for me, I think is a tremendous tool that, that an instructor can use at a confidence level that students can have when they come into these courses and have that sort of attention to their design. Now, in the classroom itself, you took five courses in this certificate program. What was the collaboration like within, with your peers and maybe even your instructors? What was that like? It was very close. It's a small group. There were some courses where we have just a few students involved. What I found most exciting was that those students range from folks like myself in kind of this, I would just call it mid-career. We had graduate students who were very fresh and who were also actively involved as teaching assistants. So they were really inside, inside the space, working with students applying these things in real time so we could get some very good, almost laboratory-like feedback as we talked about the process. And then there were other folks who were really postdoc type individuals who were building on, we had a couple of attorneys, and they were building on their skill sets so they could go and teach extremely high level graduate law type courses. And that experience enabled me to have some confidence that look, post-career there, there there's a lot to do and you've got lots to offer. So here's how you set yourself up. 
So this continuum of professional experience was what I really valued. And then each of the instructors had a very real world sort of research passion. And whether that was in assessment design or whether that was in um, student learning styles, we could really dig in into those courses around those particular topics and how they were relevant to the, whichever subject we were in, whether it was in one of the assessment courses or whether it was in the uh, student engagement course. So I, I found that to be a really beautiful compliment. And I, I know that I think some of the best feedback I got was from a, a TA who was in the computational instruction section, a graduate student, who really helped me understand that connection with the students who have such a high amount of demand for you better be on the cutting edge, you better be on the cutting edge. How do you deal with that when it's impossible almost for the instructor to stay that far ahead considering the wealth of information that's out there? So a great environment and very close collaboration. And to me, that sounds like it's a set up, the perfect setup for any classroom is it's the quality of the interaction and the discussion amongst peers and learners learning from each other. Because sometimes as instructors, we don't have all of the answers. We don't have all of the knowledge that the students themselves have. And being able to cultivate that environment sounds like, which was the case here, of being able to collaborate and learn from each other from the different levels of students that really does create a really rich learning environment. I, I, I do. I, I don't. I don't regret that I'm done. But I almost wish that we'd had a few more courses because you started to really build up uh, some momentum. And uh, I, you know, Dr. O'Brien, in, in her connection with the students, was quite clear about maintaining that engagement and connection. So I, I, I felt that, and I guess I, I do miss it a little bit as, uh, as it's wound down and people have moved on. But I, I get an email once in a while from my former student. Uh, colleagues and you know just commiserating how's it going what's happening so that's reinforcing absolutely sometimes just the network afterwards is the is one of the big highlights of a graduate degree is being able to have those people that you can have touch points with when maybe something is confusing or you need some feedback on an idea that you have that really is a, a great benefit of of a graduate program, especially at UMBC, they cultivate that environment. That's what that's what I felt from my graduate program anyway, is that networking is really big. It is, it is. Yeah. I, I've got my, my retriever pride all behind me. I've got my favorite backdrop here up. Yes. And, uh, I've been to a number of universities for various programs, but I really felt it at UMBC. Mm, that's great to hear. What was your biggest takeaway from studying at UMBC? Uh, I would say my, there were two big takeaways. One was actually the level and caliber of work that's going on in this space. This was an area I was familiar with some of the technical uh, pieces of UMBC and their engineering school and their uh, computer science school, but I really didn't understand what, what the faculty had been engaged in on this, in this learning space. Uh, and I see, I saw it permeated throughout, I, I had a chance to act as a, an under instruction instructor uh, in the engineering group and even the faculty in the engineering department had all really well embraced uh, these approaches. So I felt like there was a good uh, collaboration both across the departments as well as a real, some of the research that we talked about were the, the, the cutting edge names that were first person colleagues and collaborators with the instructors. So that gave you a sense of, gosh, we, we really are in the space where history is being made or the next generation of uh, learning science is being developed. That was very exciting to me. And I didn't really think about it in a way of that you might think about a, a, you know, chemistry or biology, but in reality, that, that's the sort of work that's going on. So that was a huge takeaway, one which was a little humbling because it's the, the workload that these faculty are under is enormous. Absolutely. Now, you said there were two takeaways. <laughs> so the second takeaway was everything's great until you have to put it in practice. So in the, the final courses, you're involved in a, in a practicum where you're actually working uh, in a classroom setting. You're giving some instructional materials. You're executing as you would in a higher education setting. And I had the chance to do, uh, I did a double course. I did one which was a senior engineers and their senior design course, which is ENME 440. And then I also did... 101, which is a huge, I think there are 185 students in the class. 
Wow. And so it's in the it's in the engineering lecture hall. And of course, it's that tremendously raked lecture hall, and you're down there in the center, and the students are zeroing in on you, and you've got your curriculum, and you've got your material you're going to teach, but you realize that, yep, you've got this tremendous plan, and you want it to go exactly according, and inevitably it derails. You need to take care of a question. I had one, ex- one experience where I think I made a terrible math error, and a young student, she calls it out and says, hey, I think you're wrong. Not just, hey, by the way, but you're wrong. And your first reaction is, I, and then I thought, oh my gosh, I, I am yeah, absolutely right. So I had a chance to talk about highlighting, you know, thanking the student, but at the same time highlighting, hey, look, we're trying to do a lot in a short amount of time. Let's co- collaborate with each other, but try to get to the right outcome. So it was the takeaway was humility is probably the first thing you're going to need to learn at any of these courses. Um, oh, I love that you just said that. I really do because. <laughs> I learned that lesson last week when I was teaching. So I teach at the, it, it's a train the trainer program at the International Masonry Institute. Oh, wow. These guys are master masons. They know that what they know what they're doing. I'm not teaching masonry skills. I'm just teaching them how to train other mm-hmm. journeymen and apprentices and such. I had that humility as well this week. So somebody called me out on the materials that I was using as far as a presentation. They didn't like, some of it was a little maybe crowded, too many bullet points on one page or whatnot. And at first I was like inside, I'm like, oh my God, am I turning red? Am I getting embarrassed? And I was like, you know what? Let's use this as a really great teaching opportunity here as instructors. You're all instructors. Let's use this. When people are going to give you feedback, and we just put a positive spin to, you have to be open to getting feedback and being, having humility enough to accept. You don't have to agree, but to accept that feedback because it's the most important thing in a classroom is that students feel they have a voice and that their opinion matters and their thoughts and their knowledge base matters. And as instructors, one of the things that came out of that conversation was they love that they don't have to feel like they have to know everything. And that being, having that humility and standing up there and accepting feedback actually puts students at ease. And so having that spirit of feedback within a classroom, that was a big light bulb that went off for me last week. It was a great experience for everybody involved. So <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. What a great what a great moment and to, to really to flip that like that so that we're all gaining something from it that's a sign of a deft instructor so that must have been really at the end of that I, you should feel quite excited about that because that's a tremendous connection to make with your students yeah it felt good and it felt i felt like it really resonated with the with my fellow learners because we're all learners and that's what it taught me is that we're all on a learning journey none of us have all the answers but together we can figure out some really great solutions yeah, that's tremendous. I saw that demonstrated you know, across the faculty spectrum, and, and obviously these are very seasoned uh, instructors. Between the Dr. LaBerge and Dr. Gorganis in the engineering department, there is they were willing to let me go into their classes and, and, and mess around, but uh, you could. Uh, I got some very good feedback from each of them, and the best one I got from Dr. LaBerge when I put my first deck together, he says, this is a beautiful deck. You're not going to get past the first quarter of it. I said, no, of course, he was absolutely right. But it's tremendous to have that sort of guidance and mentorship and make yourself better as not just an instructor, but a learner. I agree. Absolutely. Quick question. Did you get your systems engineering graduate degree here at UMBC or elsewhere? No, I did. I took, uh, I took my MS in systems engineering there. A small, let's see, the, I think the, we had three in the class that graduated this past May. And again, they were all uh, other professionals required to up their game a little bit. I did my best for Dr. O'Brien, trying to recruit them into uh, the CTLS program. One was intrigued, and so I, I'm going to go back to him and say, hey, you need to come back and give that thought, because sooner or later, we're all going to be asked to give forth on what we know and try to help that next class, if you will, the next cadre of folks coming in behind us, because we do have a limited time. Absolutely. And maybe he'll listen to this podcast and be inspired to say, hey, I do have to go and take this. <laughs> I'm going to let him know that it's time to tune in. Tune, tune in. in and find out. Tune in and find out. Jonathan, this has been a really great conversation. I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. And I just, I love talking learning. So thank you for allowing me to in, interpret what you're saying. And we ha- I just had a great conversation with you and I'm really grateful. 
Thanks. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of UMBC's Miked Up Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about our offerings, do a quick search for UMBC College Teaching and Learning Science Graduate Certificate Program and also Master of Science in Systems Engineering at UMBC. Or simply click the link in the description.